Uh, the largest number of people who died in a day and reported as it relates to the city of New Orleans uh, really kind of gave me a gut punch. And I told my team, I said, listen, it's time to go back into that public and to reiterate and encourage our people to stay the course. I noticed over the holiday weekend, and you know, we did this press conference on Thursday in urging people that even though we were faced with Easter holiday, we urge you to stay at home and to stay put. We had some amount of calls to the New Orleans Police Department on that Friday and on that Saturday. And as I just sat and just embraced and said, you know, there's a lot of traffic out. There's a lot of movement. And I asked my people on that Saturday afternoon to reiterate, stay at home, stay the course, because it matters. And not only that, and even as we have looked at the numbers over the past five days, six days, we're seeing real glimmers of hope, meaning that the positive cases are slowing down. And as we told you, that while we would see and we were hopeful to continue to see cases slow in terms of positives, but also brace and prepare ourselves for more deaths. And as we look at the data, what we have been saying is accurate. So a day like today is one that I do not want to get used to. What I want to get used to is for the number of our residents continue to be fewer and fewer as it relates to positive cases in our city. And in order for that to happen, we need to stay the course. We need to stay at home and not be misled by what we're telling you are feeling hopeful. We want you to be hopeful, but understand that we will not get to where we need to be as a city and as a community if we do not continue to do what we've, we've been doing, staying at home because it's working. And now is the time to really double down on our efforts and not let up because we have to understand that the positive impacts that we've seen, meaning fewer cases, it's a result of what we were doing two weeks ago. So we need to continue to stay the course. And I'm just here to encourage you that your actions, they matter, and that, that, that your actions will lead to our city being safer in the next weeks to come. And for us to be rid of this coronavirus entirely, but we will not get there. We will not get there if we do not continue to stay the course, stay at home, and to do what we're asking you to do. And with that, meaning fewer cases and being rid of coronavirus, it means that we will officially be rid of the deaths that our families and that our communities are suffering from. It's very painful. It is very painful. And I know that the families feel it more even than I do. I'm sure they do. But I want you to know that as the mayor of the city of New Orleans, I'm confident that we will get through this but I need you to be encouraged and to know and understand that your actions matter now more than ever. So continue to stay at home. Continue when you're out and about doing essential business only, put on your masks. When you're at work or if you're a customer, put on the mask. It matters. 
Everyone has a responsibility and a role to play fighting this pandemic. And collectively, as we work together, we're seeing again our mandates to stay at home, they're working. But it's where we are today, but it's where we really want to be tomorrow. And so with that, I'm going to ask Dr. Jennifer Vegno, who is an extraordinary leader of the New Orleans Health Department, to come on up and to share just a little bit more with you. But my main goal today is to encourage you and to ask you to stay at home. Dr. Vegno. Thank you very much, Mayor. Just to reiterate, um, today is a painful day and it's a personal day for all of us. Um, we're encouraged by the fact that for the past seven days, our cases have been lower, have been trending down. We expect that after four weeks of our stay at home order, we're, we're finally starting to see the results. But the deaths increasing is what we always knew and feared would happen. I don't think there's anyone in the city of New Orleans who does not know someone who has not been touched by death from COVID. These are wartime numbers, and this is a battle. And when you march into battle, you have to give it everything. And so thank you to our residents who have been giving it everything, despite great personal and financial cost. What you have done by staying at home is buy us more time, buy our hospitals time. Our hospitals are in a much better place than they were. They're not out of the woods. And any deviation from the stay at home can put them back in a very, very precarious condition. But they have a little bit more room to do what they do and care for our loved ones even though they're saving a whole lot of lives, though, they're not miracle workers and they can't save everybody. And that's reflected in the numbers that we saw today. And so when the families grieve, our healthcare workers grieve with them and all of us do. Our, our rate of fatality right now, again, remains at about one in 20 cases, meaning of every 20 cases of COVID, about one person dies. So I just ask everybody, when you're thinking about going out for something non-essential or having that gathering, is it worth it for a 5% chance of someone you love dying? And I, don't, I think we all know the answer to that. Again, everybody can take big steps and little steps. Face coverings are a small step, but multiplied by the population of New Orleans, they're huge. Um, you're going to hear in a minute about some, some yard signs that we will be making available to put in your yard to let your friends, your neighbors, those around you know why you stay home. I think we all have the same reasons, but it's really just for one goal, and that's to keep us healthy and safe throughout this. Again, we want you to be healthy. We want you to be safe and we appreciate everybody's patience while we get through this. Thank you. Gotten a little emotional. <laughs> and when you think about the life of our city, which runs through the veins of the residents of this beautiful city and the many that we've lost, it does make me smile simply because we have a responsibility. We, we have a responsibility to one another. So not only continue to stay home, but also understand that as we look towards coming out of this, and there's been a lot of talk about it, well then, you know, the old, it's the old, what a time, what a time. When we have that second line and uplifting all of the families who've lost but as we also think about recovery and what that looks like, understand that we are paying very close attention to what's happening around us. Not only throughout the state of Louisiana, 
various parishes or the states that are adjacent. What we see is the city of New Orleans beginning to flatten that curve, but at the same time seeing our other neighbors starting to therefore get peak and even get sicker. So that will have an immediate impact on how this city stands herself back up and how we move towards a full recovery. So with that, I want you to be mindful of that. The decisions that we made as a city, they were the right steps to take. And because we acted so soon, we're not only we're seeing where we've peaked, but we're also seeing now where we're beginning truly to flatten that curve. But let's continue to do our part. Please continue to do your part. I will ask our Director of Homeland Security, Colin Arnold, uh, to come up now and to give you updates as it relates to what he's been working on and his entire uh, staff. So, Colin. Thank you, Mayor. So, Jen said this is a battle. We're in a war. And when you're in a battle, there's casualties. We've had people that are sick and in hospitals, and we've had people die. And as the mayor said, you know, today was a bad day. And, you know, we are always hopeful and know that it will get better. But we are presented with a challenge that I talked about on Thursday with how to um, respectfully take care of those among us, our friends, our neighbors, our loved ones, everyone's been touched by this, uh, who, have, who have passed away. And this is, you know, about how to store and preserve these people with dignity until they can be buried, until they can have their services. We've worked with, uh, the mayor was very, very clear from the beginning of this that we would get with the death care community, faith-based leaders, hospitals, my office, the coroner's offices, both here and in Jefferson Parish, and, and work out how we could do that. And, you know, we have started that in conjunction with the state. We have, as I mentioned Thursday, a total of 14 uh, refrigerated trailers at the coroner's office. There is a team there now assembled by the state to manage that as an extension of the coroner's office. Um, they've been working on it since Saturday. Uh, they have a plan, and they're going to execute that plan. We have an additional 10 refrigerated trailers in New Orleans East at a city facility uh, for staging and potentially and hopefully not needed for a secondary temporary morgue site that that team that's at the coroner's office would also run as well. You know, part of the task force, and it, it's broad uh, uh, membership, you know, and I'm talking funeral homes and cemeteries, mortuaries from not only New Orleans but around the region, including the North Shore, uh, have all contributed to making sure, one, that the community uh, that, that death care community understands the importance of PPE. My office has been able to provide, uh, you know, not as much as, of course, I'd like to, but uh, an amount of PPE um, to restock them uh, in the interim until some of these supplies become more available because we realize the importance of them being protected. And also, you know, talking about sanitization and some other things that needed to be brought up within the community to make sure that they were, that they were good to go. And that's happened. The other part of this, though, is the outreach that the faith-based community and the funeral homes can do to the public to let them know that it's really important to, you know, conduct these services within three to five days when practical, when, when absolutely practical, and really to, you know, consider the option of a burial or a direct cremation and then a memorial service when things are better you know, when we can have gatherings again. You can have a funeral right now, but realize that even in the industry and by the state and, and what, we're, what we're telling the public is, it's limited to a household size gathering, which we know in New Orleans we have a, we celebrate the life of a person as much as we grieve their death and in funerals here. And so this is a huge challenge, but I know this community can rise to that challenge. And um, the, the task force that was put together, the guidance that's been given, I think will, will help the community in that regard. And um, I just want everybody to continue to, to do their best to be well. Thanks. Thank 
kill that set. Sanitize. <laughs> Only in New Orleans. So with that, um, we'll go to Q&A. Uh, just give me three questions. Um, number one, uh, Louisiana has reached uh, more than a thousand death toll from coronavirus. Uh, are African are African Americans still dying at the uh, highest rate in the state? And um, with this, uh, what should Afri African Americans and other minorities be doing to now stay safe and healthy in this time? Right, so we talked about the disparities and the disparity gaps uh, that are prevalent in the city of New Orleans, the so social determinants of health is what they, what we call it. And the city of New Orleans has truly been laser focused uh, on these disparity gaps within the African American community being very intentional about it and even as it relates to really in that post-Katrina environment with more medical homes or clinics in neighborhoods than ever before. Uh, getting grants, fit NOLA, to deal with obesity. Uh, rallying and pushing for a smoke-free New Orleans. All of those things and so much more was because of how intentional we've been as a community on focusing on the disparities that are real. No denying it. And when I think about it, and even when you, we started to report on this or you started to hear more uh, in the media about um, these, uh, the health conditions or the pre-existing conditions that we know are prevalent, and chronic illnesses that are heavily within the African-American communities, and you can look at census tracts, and I mean, it's unbelievable, but they're real. But even from my husband looking at the list, he said, Huh, I have everything on that list. Educated man, African American, you know, now going to the doctor, now taking meds. So there are multiple, multiple causes as it relates to these disparities that we know of and that we've been intentional in fighting. But a part of it as well is also protecting oneself and making sure that our people are encouraged and they go to the doctor, that they're taking the medication that they need. They're not listening to the myths, you know, because when we started as it relates to this pandemic, um, in some areas in our community, and particularly the black community, it was the thought that black people couldn't be impacted by COVID. And so we've been hit with the harsh reality is that not only these disparity gaps are real, but they're attached to real people. And you have a commitment from me as mayor and my administration to continue to narrow down and focus on them being intentional. And that's why, even as we start this week and into the next week, we're going to uh, move forward with our mobile testing. So we're going into communities, again, being very intentional as we look at the data and we're looking at areas maybe that we just need to go and touch to make sure that we are providing testing where necessary, but also that access to care. So that will be happening this week, moving into next week, but it again speaks to the intentionality, but telling the community across the board they need to stay at home. Uh, and, um, and our folks are in harm's way because of the disparity gaps that exist within our community. Chronic illness, you know, heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, kidney disease, all these things are real. And we're seeing the impact, you know, within the black community, and that's real as well. Uh, do you think the uh, standard of home order is working? Um, have we reached the curve? Um, talk about the flattening of the curve and um, how, how long this uh, stay at home order will last. Right, so we've covered um, that. As it relates to one, we've seen a, our peak and we have now start to see um, results of the mandates that have been put in place, to meaning we are starting to flatten that curve. We're not there yet, and this is the time that we really need to double down and strengthen our efforts and to understand that everyone plays a part in this. And the little thing to stay at home will end up being a huge thing in the end because that's 
fewer people and fewer lives that have been lost as it relates to to this uh, virus. Last thing uh, in uh, in regards to the schools. Um, uh, seniors are going to miss out on prom, graduation. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? And uh, do you know if the seniors were receiving diplomas in the mail? So one of the things I think you you asked me prior to this was how long you know would this stay in place? And right now our mandate, the date on the proclamation was the 16th of April, which will be extended, um, and that's happening now. But the virus is determining the timeline and it will continue to do so and we will adjust accordingly. And as it relates to our young people and all oh, men, our seniors, you know, I know that the school community, both private, parochial and public, are working together hopefully on a unified message in ways that we can again stand up and, and provide our kids with some form of, of celebratory action. Uh, but it will not be uh, normal. Uh, but it will be, hopefully, it'll give them uh, just the love and support that they need, you know, to move on. Uh, my daughter is uh, in sixth grade and was notified on last week that their school will end. And uh, she and her classmates were crying on online, you know, crying on FaceTime. So it's really hitting. It's hitting our young people of all ages. And uh, of course, it's being felt throughout all of our households. And uh, we're wanting to make sure that we're providing the best supportive services to our young people and, of course, our seniors who are graduating. We're so proud of them uh, moving forward. What are the consequences for non essential business will um, face if they keep operating? Non essential businesses that are operating will be shut down. So if you know of any, and you can call uh, 311 to notify the city, and we will shut them down. Uh, we're also shutting down essential businesses that do not follow the rules, like social distancing, that are not protecting even their, their workforce. Um, but the social distancing has to happen, and those essential businesses that are not following the rules will be shut down as well, and we have shut many down however you know we go with a little warning and um, most actually comply after the warning so we want to work with people but at the same time this is a crisis and we're not going to give a long rope so we're going to nip it in the bud and I got gave two analogies into one a, a rope and a rosebud <laughs> Uh, Mayor um, from WWL-TV, we'd like to know if French Quarter Fest and the Jazz and Heritage Festival should be held in the fall or pushed back to next year. Yeah, my opinion is all of that pushed back, period. Simply because of the impacts in terms of our recovery, we're not just impacted in terms of how well we're doing in our city. We're impacted by what's either not happening in other cities around us. In, in other states that are further behind us. And so as they go through and come through it, because I believe they will, um, it will have an impact on the operations of the city of New Orleans, per particularly as it relates to our largest uh, uh, industry, which is uh, hospitality and tourism. And so with that, uh, my recommendation is absolutely no uh, large events such as uh, French Quarter Fest and Jazz Fest, even Essence Festival, uh, as it relates to the year of 2020, that the focus should shift to 2021. Have you had a chance to talk to the organizers about those events? Actually, I have. I have, and you'll you'll see you'll see signs of that. That's not just coming from me. However, you'll see um, from a collaborative manner. You'll see signs of, of change. Hello, Madam Mayor from uh, WVUE. Uh, how do you see the city moving forward to help the tourism industry come back as we get through this? And then also, could you give us any update on are there are there any occupied beds in the convention center? What's the status on that? And then uh, I have a question for Dr. Avegno once those two are done. Sure. So I'll just touch I'll touch on the standing the city back up as it relates to recovery and our hardest, uh, you know, our hit industry in terms of tourism and hospitality. Um, we're looking at it 
For example, the governor is standing up a commission. And as I uh, talked with his leadership on yesterday, just getting a sense of who's serving on the commission and the representation there for the hospitality industry, how they're looking at it as one, kind of separating even our restaurants, although they're part of, right, but looking very um, narrowly focused on restaurants that will be able to stand up, right, sooner rather than later, but in terms of talking about our industry, are always a part of of that industry. So it's going to be uh, taking a layered approach in terms of what, which businesses that are a part of our hospitality and tourism industry that would be able, in terms of a priority, standing back up sooner rather than later. I think our larger uh, hoteliers will have an issue. Our smaller, um, you know, hotels probably not so much. But this is all just. Um, hypotheticals, um, but um, I am starting to have these types of conversations with hospitality and tourism as I call. Now I'm on uh, calls with them three times a week. I was every day. But we're beginning to pivot and really looking at what recovery will mean. And so much of this will come even from that bottom up from them. And then I will support every step of the way. But at the same time, using data to drive the decision making. And when we look at data, we have to be very much focused on what's happening around us. Even when we're better, how we'll be impacted by those who are not. And we're seeing these signs even as various countries that have had a unified uh, plan in place um, to where they're starting to be uh, re uh, you know, uh, affected. Um, as it relates to the virus, like Japan, for example. So we're, the city, is going to have to be very, very strategic and focused uh, and build the data into our recovery strategy and our plan. So um, it's hypothetical at this time, but we have to look at what's happening around us. And from what we see, uh, New Orleans will be a little island for a while in terms of the impact that's happening again around us, not only in the state of Louisiana, but uh, neighboring states as well. I'll ask Dr. Vagno to come forward and give you a little bit more. So to answer your question about the, um, the convention center and the medical monitoring station, as of this morning, there were 75 patients there. They're continuing to accept new patients every day. I think we talked about uh, maybe last week that they had expanded from region one to regions three and nine, and those are the state regions. Um, those are regions that are starting, as the mayor said, to see their surge. Uh, and so again, allowing the facility to be that safety net valve is gonna be critical for those hospitals as well to be able to keep um, on that same question, um, as far as the health care workers, since we're in week four of this, are you all seeing any health care workers getting sick? And what's the situation with the health care worker force in the in the hospitals and the in the city in general? So we're not, no one is directly tracking healthcare workers um, and who's getting sick. Of course, if you are a healthcare worker, anecdotally, you have friends who have either had symptoms or tested positive. Um, they're part of our community, just like everybody else, so we wouldn't expect them to be immune. Uh, I will say, again, the hospitals are holding steady. Their bed capacity is steady, their ventilators are adequate, their ICU beds are adequate, and that's because in a very short period of time, they were able to completely completely change operations to support greatest need. Um, you know, also, we, we want all of our citizens to use their health care facilities if they have an emergency, but we really are seeing people, if they don't have an emergency, are not going to the hospital like they used to. Um, and there's probably a lot of reasons for that, but it does help extend the capacity as well. And Jessica. 
Um, a couple. Um, so, Madam Mayor, when you say that uh, all major events should be pushed back, um, we wanted to know, does that include Saint season? And then the second question is, the governor recently said that, uh, you know, local governments get 45 percent of the state's $1.8 billion. Um, how is New Orleans going to spend that money, or what is it going to reimburse itself for things that it has already spent? Could you talk a little bit about um, what you're hoping to get and how you're hoping to spend it? Well, I think what you need to be clear on is that this is tied to expenses. Mm -hmm. So it's not we're getting anything. Right. We, 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 we're not getting anything. And even as the formula relates, it's only tied to expenses. It's not tied to losses at all. Mm -hmm. So when we look at our bottom line and when we forecast, we're looking at it as today about $150 million deficit. Over 126 plus, right, is tied to sales tax, meaning losses. So if the uh, formula doesn't take account losses, then we're screwed. Okay. And we're going to have to make some very tough decisions as it relates to uh, city government, um, our workforce, and we're, we've, been, we've really been focusing on this for weeks now. Um, we really we, we have and we're advocating you know at the federal level for another package that um, speaks to the losses that cities will have um, and even businesses for that matter because again it's on expenses but it's not on losses which is which is a game changer uh, if that is out of the equation and can you speak to whether any, give, give us any updates on the city's bottom line and whether there have been any decisions about furloughs or cuts? You talked about that being on the table a couple of weeks back mm -hmm. and said that you were looking at sales taxes and, and when those start coming in uh, post Mardi Gras. Are you close to any decisions about that? Well, I wouldn't say, well, we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Um, over the past week, we really were able to comb through that CARES Act and have a better understanding of what that will mean. Um, and as we reported on Thursday, it was very clear that the way that it's structured, again, that it doesn't account for losses. And so that has had uh, us to over the weekend, uh, my team forecasting even as relates to yesterday and today. So we are getting closer, but there are various options that we're putting on the table before we make decisions. And so right now uh, I'm looking at multiple options uh, that, yeah. Okay. And can you speak to whether when you say you want things to be pushed back, does that include the Saints season and um, Well, I think the, the uh, NFL, NFL is, is struggling with that now, all mm -hmm. the organized sports uh, teams. Yeah. And I think for the right reasons. Yeah. Um, so I don't know what that's going to look like, but what I do know is that expecting people traveling, I mean, again, yeah. it, it speaks to that. If we're, if we're well and we're better, and better than even our surrounding areas and states and who comes, I think we'll have to think about that. It'll all be factored into not only when New Orleans opens back up, but when the state and when the United States truly, you know, opens back up to where we are confident and comfortable but safe in, in going about our way. And I don't think anyone um, has a clue right now. You know, we're, right. we're looking at hypotheticals, we're looking at data, but one thing, the data doesn't lie, and it clearly shows us without a unified strategy nationally, it's impacted our response, not only locally, but yeah, locally. Right. Across the across the country. And last question, uh, both you and Dr. Avegno spoke about debts and knowing, um, you know, everybody in the city of New Orleans at this point either knows someone who's died from the disease or has someone in their family who has. Can you talk about how that has affected you personally, if you know any of any of the victims and how hard it was to hear about their debts? Oh, it's always hard. And and there have been, you know, some, some high profile, you know, well, it's Ellis Marcellus and some that, you know, Coach, you know, Coach Reese, I mean, well-known. Uh, and even Chris Marks, Christopher Marks. Um, I hired him to run EMD for the city of New Orleans in my administration. And his family had to bury him on yesterday. And he literally, single-handedly, turned our equipment maintenance division around in a department that was, I mean, unbelievable. 
you know, where the IG was, you know, reports and all this thing going on, you know, within EMD. And Christopher Marks came in, and I mean, he literally, again, turned it around, and his family buried him on yesterday. And all of my public safety team, for example, oh, it, it, it hit hard. It rippled through. You know, all of our entire team, the New Orleans Police Department, EM, I mean, unbelievable. So, and that just goes on and on and on. So it's, um, it's personal every step of the way from, you know, my first guy, you know, Eugene, who called me up and told me he was in, had no idea, you know, only to learn that Eugene, you know, passed away. Or, you know, uh, Levi, I showed my uh, staff before coming to this press conference. I was looking for this platter. I said, I know I have this platter around here somewhere. Because one of our people, he and his wife, the Arnolds, both passed away. And they made me a platter when I was, um, got inaugurated almost two years ago. And I went to find that platter and the whole story behind it, because they were saying, Mayor, you don't have a full plate, you have a platter. So I had to pull the platter out so I can you know, we have to love on our people even through death. And so that was my way of sharing and getting through it while my folks couldn't give me a hug. <laughs> so it's just ways that we have to find the love and share the love. And when we do that, we feel it. Dr. Rebecca. Yeah, as I said, this is personal, and there, there are no degrees of separation in New Orleans on a, on a regular day. Um, and, and, and really, this is nationwide. You know, under, unlike Hurricane Katrina, where we all lost someone and something, this is happening to friends all over the country that I've only been able to have a call with as their grandfather was being put on a ventilator in Georgia and trying to walk them through that process when I knew the outcome and I knew that there was nothing anybody could do. Um, and then being the healthcare workers who are standing in for family members at the very end of life, um, it is heartbreaking. What we want to do is if you are going to die in a hospital, we want it to be surrounded by love and people who love you and, and the knowledge that your care team is there for you and supporting you. And now all that's gone except for the care team. Um, and you know, while I know my colleagues in the healthcare field are incredibly empathetic, um, they're also dealing with their own losses as they have to hold the hands of dying patients and FaceTime their loved ones on the phone. Um, so there, there's a, there is a huge toll. Um, it's something that we're thinking about very deeply in terms of what are the long-term mental health effects on all of us, um, you know, particularly those of us who have lost someone and can't grieve, or our healthcare frontline workers who, um, who have to do this repeatedly. Uh, and so again, I just, you know, I think we are a community that supports each other. I think there's been a wonderful outpouring of support as much as we possibly can, but it is so different from our normal way of grieving and supporting um, that we're all, I think, struggling with it a little bit. Okay. So Mayor, this is kind of to repeat the same ask a different version of the previous question about the saint season because we have a lot of people on social media who are really concerned about this i know uh have you have you talked to the nfl at all about this and and maybe is, are you all looking at a vision of what the saint season might be here in new orleans like maybe games without fans or any ha have you had any thoughts i mean i know you're up to well, all the other stuff going on well no i have not had any conversations with anybody you know, as it relates to the NFL or Miss Gale, you know, um, which is so I know I have not. Um, but I want the health and safety, you know, of our players and all the players to be at the forefront. Just that's that's the top priority. So I don't see right now. I, I don't know how that would work. Um, but I do know that there's been there's you know some thought. Those who are in the right to positions to have those types of conversations that they're having them and I believe they'll end up in the right place but at the end of the day you know we have to be realistic 
and I think the data should drive what we're able to do and also um, put ourselves in a position to when we're, when we're better and we're healed that we can stay that way and not open ourselves up or subject, you know, um, just subject our community back to another COVID outbreak. So it's, um, it's something to, you know, to think about, but I think life is more important. You know, that's the, the main thing. Life is more important and we need to live to see another day. Uh, and so I know that was the last question. What I will say is not only thank you, but also, yeah. Who is that on that other line texting you like that? Go ahead. <laughs> um, can you uh, tell me how many, uh, how many uh, large gathering calls are received over the Easter weekend? And also, could you elaborate on those yard signs? Okay, so I don't have the number right in front of me. Ooh, and I don't want to misspeak, but there's, we've been tracking, NOPD has been tracking all these calls since, you know, since weeks ago. Um, but I do know that on Saturday, there was like maybe 140 some odd calls. And that's when, you know, it really felt like, wait, there was too much movement going on throughout the city. It just sounded different, right? And when we doubled down on the messaging and telling people to stay home, too much activity on that Sunday, um, it had reduced to about 42 calls. So clearly, just based on Saturday, Sunday, people, um, they listened and they did what we asked them to do. Not 100%, but a, 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 good, a good amount did the right thing. So with that, you know, thank you again, but understand, oh, the yard sign, okay. This is, I'm staying home, wanna do it? All right, let me go over here. <laughs> All right, so our office with Nola Ready is always trying to do some innovative things. So we, we put together a bunch of yard signs. These are gonna go out to the residences uh, through the council districts, through neighborhood engagement office. You'll be able to find them, but it's, um, you know, kind of, um, uh, we want to channel people's optimism into continuing to stay home because they're going to look forward to do something when Noel is ready. And, uh, and we will be ready, um, you know, eventually. But it's not today and it's not going to be tomorrow and it's not going to be next week. But think about this with your Sharpie. And, you know, one of the first things that you want to do once people are able to actually go out and we can start gathering again, I think that's going to be a big part of this. But, um, you know, th this is one part of the messaging. The other is we've, we've created signs reminding people about social distancing, reminding people about playground equipment and areas being closed uh, to the public right now and, uh, you know, about staying home that will be in parks uh, along neutral grounds. Um, we're we're going to put them. We're going to put them all over. So, um, you know, just something we were thinking of. Uh, Mayor was very supportive of, and um, you know, just reminding people that you know there's a time for optimism, and we want people to be optimistic. But we also need people to be realistic. Thank you, yes, ma'am. And one thing is clear about the sign when you when you read it, uh, when Nola's ready. You know, I can. And it makes you smile just thinking about what you can, what you'll be able to do. So I'm looking forward to uh, the public having some fun with that and just showing, you know, how you're just so excited about when we can, when NOLA is ready, I can. And I have a whole list of what I can make that, fill that gap in, I tell you that truth. But before we end, I do want to say thank you and also understand that as I talk about the deaths that we've had. And you know, we've had, you know, disaster after disaster, you know, with under our administration, it's a fact. And we've been able to combat them one at a time, you know, and we will continue to do that. But there's one that still sticks with me and is in my heart. And when I talk about the death of folks, I have to think about, in every death, I think about Quinyan and Jose. Quinyan and Jose. And um, their bodies remain in that collapsed structure. And I just want the public to understand that in no way I can stand here and talk about death and not be mindful of two families and two people 
who cannot be laid to rest right now. So after all of this, even in death, we have families that receive their loved ones' remains, but we continue to have two families that I'm fighting for every single day so that they can get their loved ones. And so as of uh, yesterday, uh, in the last status conference hearing, and I know you all were, were there, and the judge uh, gave a mandate that demolition plans stamped by an engineer needs to be and must be submitted to the city of New Orleans by April the 17th. And so as soon as we have a plan that we can move forward towards demolition, that's the sooner we'll be able to rescue the remains, to get the remains of our loved ones so that Quinyan and Jose will finally be ready to, let, to, to rest. So thank you and um, you know, God bless you. That is LaToya Cantrell, the mayor of New Orleans, wrapping up a press conference talking about the latest about the coronavirus. She also said that mid-April is the date that a judge has required a demolition plan to be submitted to the city of New Orleans to take down the Hard Rock Hotel collapse site. So that is another bit of news coming out of today's news conference. Now, Mayor Cantrell began the press conference talking about how today was a very hard day. She called it a gut punch that the state of Louisiana has now surpassed a thousand deaths due to the coronavirus. This is a difficult day for her, and we heard earlier today from Governor John Bell Edwards that this is a difficult day for him as well. And we also heard some very grim details from our Homeland Security Director, who was talking about what's going to happen with the remains of a lot of those people. A lot of the people who are dying in the surrounding parishes as well, uh, are affected by the fact that we have seen this high number. So uh, they gave some details about that in this very difficult day for everyone in the state as we reach that very grim milestone, as Governor Edwards called it earlier today. Now, Dr. Avegno, who is the head of the city's health department, she talked about how the hospitals are handling all of this. Dr. Avegno said that the hospitals are doing okay so far, that they are in a much better position that they are, than they would have been had ever everyone not stayed home had we not enacted all of the measures that have really clamped down on pretty much everything in the city of New Orleans that is non essential. So if we had not taken these mitigation measures, she said we would be in a much different position. And she said at this point, the hospitals are doing well. They're managing to handle the surge and the influx of patients as those numbers and as that that increase in the number of hospitalizations slows. And we did see a decrease in that actually today, even though we saw an increase in the number of deaths overnight. The largest number that we've seen in a 24 hour period happened over the last 24 hours, according to officials. Now, Dr. Avegno said that when our family members grieve, our health care workers are grieving, and that's something that she didn't want people to forget as they are making the decision about whether or not they need to go out for something. And we've heard Governor Edwards say this repeatedly. If you don't need to leave your house, if, if you don't really need something, don't take the risk. Don't take the risk that you could either get infected yourself or possibly infect some other people at that grocery store, at that drug store, wherever it is that you feel like you need to go. Really think about the fact that you are making the choice about whether or not you could infect someone with that one trip to the grocery store. So he um, has really made that clear as he's continued with his messages over the last several days and even weeks. Now, something else that we heard that was big from the mayor of New Orleans in that news conference this afternoon, she is recommending that we push back all major music festivals and events that are currently scheduled for the end of this year. That includes Essence Fest, French Quarter Fest, Jazz Fest. She mentioned that she feels like all of those things need to be pushed past 2020 because of the fact that New Orleans, while we are starting to see our curve flatten, the areas around the city are not. 
She said that she has an indication that the surrounding parishes in Louisiana and the surrounding states for that matter still have not seen their peak of patients. So as we are continuing to recover on the front end of this epidemic and this pandemic in in America, there are other areas in America that are still lagging behind us. So because of that, she is saying that she is recommending to all of those event organizers that those major festivals that have already been and pushed back several months this year need to be pushed all the way back into 2021. So that's major news that we heard from her just a few moments ago at her press conference. Again, she said that we look forward to coming out of this. She also said that they're really talking right now with other leaders, with the governor.